to be put, to be made a prophetic word. God wants to put a word in our mouth. Roman number three, the definition of prophetic worship. Prophetic worship. Prophetic worship is worship that reveals the heart and thoughts of God. Through the music and the song of the worship ministry team as they are endowed, uh, f f uh, overwhelmed uh, by the spirit of prophecy with spontaneous and thematic compositions in the midst of a worship service. Listen to Psalm 45 as the psalmist declared, my heart is overflowing with a good thing. Somebody say a good thing. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. It's going to happen so spontaneous that it's going to begin to flow. It's like a ready writer who's writing inspired by God. He doesn't want anybody interrupting him lest he miss what he has been inspired to write. Well, that's the way prophecy will come. Prophecy is spontaneous. Uh, prophecy will come in a spontaneous manner. And you're going to want to flow with that spontaneity of the Holy Spirit. But it's also thematic. The Holy Spirit has a theme for every time we gather together. There's something He wants to accomplish. Something He wants to do. And He wants to use you to set the theme. Uh, he wants to use the musicians to set the theme of the Holy Ghost. So it's not just choosing the pretty songs or the most famous one. It's choosing the songs the Holy Spirit wants. It's being able to flow with the theme. And if we trust that the pastor is the angel of the church, why not ask him, what's the theme God's put on your heart, pastor? A worship leader should be able to approach their leader and say, what's the theme that you're going to preach on? I want to be able to plow the ground. I want to be able to get the ground ready so that when you sow the word, it will be received. Can we have the theme, pastor, so we can speak songs that will help build the church? There's a wisdom in this. And that is when we understand that the Holy Spirit always is out to accomplish something. He's the God of purpose. Everything that God starts, He does with an end in mind. God starts nothing with the beginning in mind. He starts everything with the end in mind. And we need to be able to think that way. What is the end? What is that God wants to do in this service? From the worship leader to the musicians to the singers to those who worship in the congregation. What will God do in our midst? What is he wanting to do and establish in the house? Prophetic worship is more than just raising hands, bowing, kneeling, dancing, shouting, singing psalms and hymns. It's more than worshiping together with great musicians and a professional orchestra. Prophetic worship is being able to bring the mind and the will of God to the forefront. Mm -hmm. Roman number one, prophetic worship fulfills the prophet Sephaniah's word. The Lord God in your midst, Sephaniah 3.17, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. And he will rejoice over you with singing. He will rejoice over you. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, He's going to rejoice over you and sing it. How will that happen? How will the Lord rejoice over you and sing through prophetic worshipers, prophetic singers, who will be inspired of the Lord to sing prophetic songs? By the end of this week, we're going to have prophetic singers sing and prophesy and song. If you're a singer, we're going to invite you to the platform to sing those prophetic songs. And we're going to release the prophetic singers of this house. Some of you have been given a gift of singing. For those of you who don't have a gift of singing, just prophesy. <laughs> don't torture yourself. Just prophesy. It's okay. You don't have to sing it. Maybe you don't have them. You have other gifts that they don't have. Uh, amen? So, but, but sing. If you have a prophetic song, a prophetic gift of singing, and if you, if, listen, if you want it, you're going to have to work hard at it so you can become skillful. Some of you have a, a prophetic singing gift, but you don't even know you have it. And you need the skills. You need to train your voice. You need to be able to use your voice properly. Amen? So that you can edify the church. I had people sing that didn't edify the church. Have you ever heard of, maybe it was just me, but I heard people sing that didn't edify anybody. Thank God, God's merciful. And he loves us so much. But I think it's time to offer up the best to God. And if that's not your call, that's not your gift, then that's okay. There are many other things.
things you could find yourself useful in. And he would always prophesy. Just speak the word of the Lord. Amen? Well, we've had to train some people to do that. Because they wanted to sing when they couldn't sing. And they wanted to sing solo in front of the church. They sang solo, alone, completely. And we, when we put them part of the worship team, we wanted to put them, they wanted, can I sing back up? Yeah, you can sing way back, behind the stage. So, you know, there's a closet behind the stage, you can sing back there. We can all sing in the shower, we sound anointed, the acoustics of the shower sound great. That's great, edify yourself, what's up? But when you come to the house of the Lord, there should be a gift, an excellence, a skillfulness uh, to carry the song of the Lord. Can you say amen? Yeah. You know there's a difference in the Bible between clean birds and, and what the Bible calls unclean birds? Unclean birds are like uh, owls, uh, crows, and uh, uh, vultures. They make noise. <laughs> you know the difference? The clean birds have a melody. They have a song. They have music inside of them. And this is, to me, no offense, but there's some clean birds in the house. There's some people who have a different ministry. They have the ministry of scaring people into the word of God. Ooh, ooh. Ah. And that's okay. We need you, too. Some people need to be scared into the word of God. So, we need to be able to engage with our gifts. Can you say amen? How many receive that? Uh, there are people who are gifted of God and can take you into the presence of the Lord in just a moment with their skillfulness and their anointed song. Well, prophetic worship reveals the testimony of Jesus. We read already uh, Revelation 19, verse 10. And Jeremiah 33, verse 11, and number 3, prophetic worship confirms the words of the prophet Jeremiah. The voice of joy the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride. Because prophetic ministry and a prophetic song of the Lord has two sides to it. It's a new song, the song of thanksgiving that comes from the church. It's the bride full of thanksgiving that will offer songs of thanksgiving, also spontaneous, also inspired of the Holy Ghost. But then there's the song of the bridegroom, which is the Lord that brings instruction and that edifies the church. And then in the first person, it's the Lord singing to his church. What is the voice of a bride singing to the Lord? The other one is the voice of the Lord singing to the church. The voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. The voice of those who will say, praise the Lord of hosts. For the Lord is good, for his mercy endures forever. And of those who will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. For I will cause the captives of the land to return as at first, says the Lord. Are you ready to see some backsliders come back home? Yeah. Number four, prophetic worship affirms the teaching of the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 14, 15 says... What is the conclusion that I will pray in my spirit and I will also uh, uh, pray with my understanding? I will sing with my spirit and I will also sing with my understanding. When's the last time you sang a spiritual song? Sang with the spirit, sang in tongues. Hello? That's what he's talking about. Praying in the spirit, singing in the spirit. Ephesians 5, 18 through 19. And uh, do not be drunk with this wine. In which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. How about Colossians 3.16? Let the Word of God dwell in you richly. Because if you have a deposit of God, then you'll have something to say and something to prophesy. Number five, prophetic worship has the same components of prophecy. In Revelations chapter 1, verse 19, as we continue to lay foundation here, these are the elements of prophecy. It was told to John, write the things which you have seen. That's the past. Write the things which are the present. And write the things which will take place after this, the future. It's the ability to foretell the future. Somebody say the past, the, past. the, present, the present, and the future. And the future. And that's why prophecy can engage in those areas. There is, uh, listen, the Bible says there's a time for everything under heaven. But in heaven, there's no time. If you can ascend to heaven, you might be able to see the past, the present, and the future. Prophets 
when they are inspired of the Lord, they're inspired sometimes with things of the past so that people understand that God knows these people. That he knows them. That he knows their trajectory. That he knows where they came from. They'll prophesy about their presence so they are aware that he's very much alive right now. But they'll also prophesy about their future. Amen? Amen. God is not the God who just foretells the future. He creates the future. Amen. And I believe that God wants to reveal the future to his church. Roman number four, as we race to the end of this lesson... This is the longest of the lessons, uh, and it happened right after lunch. I hope you're still awake. Come on. Give somebody an elbow, a Holy Ghost elbow, and say, stay awake. Come on. <laughs> David prophesied. Remember David was a prophet? David prophesied about the future. What would happen if after this week you begin to see the future of your children? And instead of putting them to bed with just a prayer, uh, and thank God for parents who still pray with their children at bedtime. But what if you could prophesy them into their future? What if you could prophesy and send just a simple prayer of protection? What a good night's sleep. What if you could prophesy to them at night and say, this is what God will do with your life. Uh, and begin to speak vision and dreams uh, and cause hope to come into them. Even at a young age. What if we could dedicate our children and in a children's dedication, they dedicated Jesus when he was eight days old. They brought him to the temple. And both Anna and Simeon, having a prophetic anointing on them, prophesied to Jesus. They prophesied to Mary. But they prophesied about the future of that child. He was young and could not understand, but Mary kept the words in her heart so that she could remind him, this is what God said when we dedicated you in the temple. Well, I believe those days need to come back to the church. When we're not so much in a rush to just dedicate children with a quick prayer. But we have prophets among us. Uh, and we call the prophets out. And when we're dedicating the children, we'll give a, a few moments for prophets to prophesy. Well, this is a big church. Well, you need a bigger company of prophets. But it can happen. And it should be restored back to the house. Because it has been so impactful. Uh, listen, we planted churches in different parts of the world. With this understanding. And when we dedicate our children, we call the prophets of the house, and we might even invite prophets from outside that might be present to dedicate their children and prophesy. Every one of my grandkids has heard their destiny since the day of their dedication. We recorded it and then played it for them. I have a granddaughter who's now 13 years of age. And when she was dedicated, the prophet said that she would be a judge. Among the great prophets that were there were Mike Herod and uh, many others who prophesied about her destiny. But the word to sum it up was that she was called to be a judge. Well, she's 13 and dying, uh, not dying, but she lives to study to be to the law. She is determined to be a judge. In a classroom, at a, at a school, uh, primary grades, the teacher asked her, why did you color yourself in a black robe and a mallet in your hand? And she says, that's easy. Teacher, it's because God said I'm going to be a judge someday. <laughs> her mother spanked her one time when she was a lot younger, of course. Her mother spanked her and disciplined her. And she said, Mommy, that hurts. And the mother said, it's supposed to hurt. And she looked at her again and said, but don't forget, someday I'm going to be a judge. <laughs> well, she got spanked again for that one. But, but the reality is they live with a passion. My oldest grandson is believing God, the prophetic word over him that government would rest upon his shoulder. So he's studying law to become part of the Senate of the United States and someday his dream is to become the governor of Florida. Well, I'm encouraging him because it's what God said. It was Manoah, the, the father of Samson. You'll find this in the, in the, the story of, of Samson when the, the angel of the Lord appeared to his wife uh, and gave her and told her she would uh, she couldn't bear children, but all of a sudden she was going to bear a miraculous child, and uh, she would conceive from her husband. The husband said, "Next time the angel comes, tell him I want to talk to him. Call me." And when he went to talk to him, he said, "Tell me when your word comes to pass." He was a man of faith, believing the word of the Lord. When your word comes to pass, what will be the rule and the work of this child? How will I raise him? And parents need to ask themselves. Don't let the educators of our day tell your children what their destiny is. We have a corrupt system of education. We need to be able to go back to the Word. 
Go back to heaven and say, God, what did you call my kids? You're giving me this child. What's his destiny? What's his call? What's the measure? Well, how should I measure? You can have five kids and they'll all measure a different measure. They all have different calls and different gifts. What will be the work of his life? Somehow the church needs to wake up to our responsibility. It's your. God gave them to you, not to the professor in the university who said, first I was an amoeba, now and then a monkey on a tree, now I'm your professor in the university. <laughs> we need godly parents full of the Holy Ghost that will prophesy destiny into their children. Yeah. Are you with me? Yes. Come on. Listen. Prophecy. David looked at the future. Listen to the scriptures as David prophesied about the future. Psalm 22, in your notes, verses 16 through 18. It says, for dogs, and this is, listen to the, to the David. This is a song of a psalmist. He's singing this song, but it's in the first person. We're going to teach you how to prophesy in the first person. Not second person, not third person. If God's speaking through you, it will be like an oracle of God. You representing him speaking to the church or singing to the church. First person. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. This, this is Jesus speaking to David. Many, many years before Calvary ever took place. He was prophesied about the future. This is exactly what would take place. The whole psalm is like a video recording of the of Calvary. Psalm 22. David prophesied about Calvary. Not only he prophesied about Calvary, he prophesied about the ascension of Christ after his resurrection. Listen to Psalm 24. Psalm 24, verse 7 through 10. Lift up your heads on your gates and lift it, lift it up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. The Lord mighty in battle. David was prophesying about the ascension of Christ. That when he died, he descended to the lowest parts of the earth. Uh, took the keys of hell and of death. Opened every prison doors of those who were dead in Christ. Our in faith uh, from Adam were in Abraham's bosom held captive. Nobody had ascended to heaven. Ancient doors were closed uh, and were, had not opened. Uh, and now David uh, sees. Uh, can you imagine David seeing Jesus uh, show up in hell? Opening up the prison doors. And Abraham's bosom, and you can see there was there's a there's a, a, a space between them and those that were dead without faith. But those that were kept in Abraham's bosom, Jesus descends to the lower parts and opens up their prison doors. I think David was excited. David probably said, This is what I wrote about hundreds of years ago. I wrote about this. Jesus, Jesus, can I lead the choir? We need to sing a song. I know what's gonna happen. You're taking up, you're taking captivity captive. And I wrote a song about this day. Can I lead it? And the worship minister of the tabernacle of David comes out of his keeping in Abraham's bosom. He begins to set the choir. Abraham, you take the tanners. And he begins to speak to all the guys. Joshua, you speak. You take the altars with some of the women. And began to put everybody in their singing place. Create the choir. And then he told them what to sing. When we get up there, when we rise, when he takes us into the presence, the first thing you're going to see us on the ancient doors. And you need to sing to them. Open up, you ancient doors. And the king of glory shall come in. And he said, then you're going to hear an answer coming from the other side of the law. They'll say, who is this king of glory? And you need to answer back correctly. He's the Lord mighty in battle. He's the Lord of glory. He is the king of glory. And as they approached heaven, they sang to the ancient doors. And guess what happened? The doors began to open. I'm not very good at this. But the doors opened. 
These ancient doors that have never opened, opened up. And there's a whole onslaught of angels on the other side lined up. And down this corridor of angels, there's a throne and a, the Father stands to receive Jesus. Jesus enters the King of Glory and all of those of the captivity enter with him behind him. Probably David standing right next to Abraham said, hey, I wrote about this one too. You want to know what's going to happen next? Because I prophesied about it. He said, I heard the Lord, the Father, speak to my Lord. And he took him to the next, to the reception of Christ in heaven. Took him to Psalm 110, verse 1, and quoted his song. I was there. I ascended by the Spirit into the very throne room of God. And the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. That's what the Father's going to say to the Son. That's why he's standing. I was here way back in Matthew 22, verse 43 and 44. Jesus also testifies of this. He said to them, how then does David in the Spirit, somebody say in the Spirit, call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So Jesus qualifies the revelation of David in Psalm 110. While he's worshiping, he had access into heaven through worship. Musicians, listen to me. You have access into heaven to hear the voice of God, to see the future, and to hear things that you have not heard yet, things that are still about to happen. David ascended between the Father and the Son, and he said, I heard the Lord say to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So when they walked down that corridor of angels, that's exactly what happened. And Jesus took his seat at the right hand of the Father, who said to him, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Are you hearing me? Yeah. David had access to the future by the Spirit of God. And I'm saying to you that the prophetic authority will give you access to see the future. The future of your children. The future of your church. The future of the families, your neighbors. The future of those that you'll encounter on the streets. The future of a nation. But somebody's got to dare to enter in. Somebody's got to dare to synchronize the ear to hear God. Somebody's got to dare to let the Holy Spirit unplug your ears to hear what God has to say. Somebody's got to dare to speak what God says. Speak my word. There's a Holy Ghost anointing that God wants to put on you during this time. Are you with me? Do you believe that God can do it? He can do it in your life? David. David receives revelation. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to read a, just a few more parts of this. This has been a long session. How do you hear me see this? Listen. 2 Chronicles 29, verse 25. This is what was given to David. This is not David's idea. Prophetic worship was not David's idea. It was God inspired me through the prophets. And he stationed the Levites in the temple of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and layers. Glyers said, in the way prescribed by David, and Gath, and the king seer, and Nathan the prophet, this was commanded by the Lord through his prophets. Davidic worship was not the idea of just one king. It was God's idea revealed to the king through his prophets, Nathan and Gad. This was a Holy Ghost divine instruction. It was preserved by every godly king that ever rose in Israel. There were many kings, kings of Israel and kings of Judah. All the godly kings, you know what their first duty was? To restore the order of David, the order of prophetic worship. And because it was a God-given thing, the ungodly kings, and God never has had a problem with the kingdom, but with kings he's had a problem. We still have a problem with kings. But the kingdom of God, it was the order for the kingdom. It was the order for worship in the house of the Lord. And every God, godly king restored divinity worship. And you'll find it all through the Bible. Even David made a mistake when he tried to bring the glory back, and you've heard it. He tried to bring the glory back like the, the Philistines did. And the Bible says that they did not seek God concerning the order, because our God is a God of order. 
He's a God that sets things clearly. He's a God that speaks what he means and he means what he says. And he's had set, but because you did not do it at first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. And the proper order was that the priest was supposed to carry the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. It wasn't supposed to be brought in to the God's people on a cart of wood like the Philistines. The Philistines got away with it because they didn't have the word of God. But God holds every believer accountable. You and I have the word. We need to return back to the word. We need to follow the protocol, establish the order of God for ministry, for the glory to be restored, and for prophetic ministries. There is a protocol. There is a divine order. We just don't do what we want to do. That's how we've gotten all these messes and divisions in the body of Christ. Let's get back to the word. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, let's get back to the word. Back to the order of God. Back to what God has established. Without the presence of God, the future is just a repetition of the past. We need to go back to the word. That the wrath of God by not come on us. God is very serious about his order. You won't miss out what God wants to do if we don't follow the path, if we don't follow the order. Listen, the next few things about the kings of Israel. King David established it in 1050 BC. It was the beginning of the prophetic worship. We'll come back and talk about the actual uh, pattern that God established through David. But it was restored. It was restored every time by God the kings. King Solomon in 10, 10 BC, talking about the prophetic order of worship. King Solomon established it. King Jehoshaphat said in 896 BC. King Jehoshaphat did it. He established the prophetic order of worship. King Joash in 835 BC again restored the order of divinity worship. King Hezekiah. In 324, 324 years later, at 726 BC, he again restores the order of worship. In 420, 427 years later, after that, King Josiah's day, in 623 BC, he again, and all these verses confirm that they restored even the people who led worship for David. And the singers and the sons of Asaph were in their place according to the command of David, Asaph, Heman, and Jonathan, the king's seed. In 514, 514 years later, the descendants of these men, in Ezra's day, the Levites, they did everything according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. In the rape, in Nehemiah's day, Nehemiah wasn't a king, but he was a governor. And he also saw the establishment and the restoration of divinity worship. Number nine in the New Testament church. The New Testament church, listen to it. The New Testament church was a prophetic church in the midst of its worship service. Listen to it. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 23 to 25, it says, Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place, the gathering, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed and un an unbeliever. Will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy, somebody say, if all prophesy, if all. and an unbeliever, an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. God's presence. The secrets are not the sins in people's lives. Listen, I'll close with this in a second. But when Saul was looking for the donkeys that he lost, somebody told him there's a seer by the name of Samuel of the city. He'll tell you everything you need to know. When he came in, God had already told Samuel, the man that's coming is to be the next king of the first king of Israel. God had already prepared and he prepared a dinner with all his leaders to receive them. And when Saul came to the gate of the city, he says, Do you know where the seer lives? And he said, I am the seer. And I've seen something about your life. He said, Come with me. I prepared a dinner for you. The best part of the dinner is reserved for you. And in the morning, I'll reveal to you what's in your heart. Secrets of the heart. I got the sins of people, but the destiny. 
that which God has prepared. Every one of you has a secret. Every citizen in this city has a secret to the way they were born with it. Their destiny. But there's got to be somebody who has eyes to see. And in the words of your pastor, can you say, I want to see the secrets of the heart? Stand with me, let's pray. How many receive this foundational teaching? This is the foundation of everything else we're going to speak about. We're going to speak about the gifts. We're going to speak about how the prophetic ministry is a conditional ministry. There are conditions to the prophetic ministry today. The difference between the old and the new is that the New Testament prophets prophesy conditional prophecies. There is no longer a revelatory prophecy, a prophecy that can add to the scripture. Now we receive a revelation of revelation. Amen? By the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit wants to and opening up our eyes to see what's hidden in people's lives. God put it there. Lord, I thank you for a church that's hungry. Hungry to see what you see. Hungry to have eyes to see. Lord, let every eye be anointed. Let every ear be opened to the counsel of your word. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you visit with every man, every woman in this place, and that there would be any partition of the Holy Ghost that would begin, even now, through the, through the exposition of your word. Bring light to us. Cause the illumination of the Holy Spirit to come on our eyes, that we might see clearly. As we adhere to your word, teach us. Teach us about hearing and speaking your word. Lord, we want to be used of you. We want to bless the families of the earth. In Jesus' name, everyone say, Amen. God bless you.